All right, so I'm going to do things a little bit out of order here, um, but I think it's going to make sense in the end. So let's talk about viruses. Um, and so we talked a little bit about viruses. We know that viruses are not cells and therefore not technically alive. So, um, viruses aren't technically alive, they're not cells, they lack some of the properties of life, but they have some of the properties of life. So they're, they're not alive, but they're not exactly not alive either. All viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. That means that in order to reproduce, they have to get inside of a cell. And all viruses are obligate intracellular parasites because all viruses lack some of the things needed to reproduce. Viruses cannot make their own proteins. They don't have ribosomes. They don't have a metabolism on their own. Uh, viruses can't generate their own ATP. They don't have mitochondria. They don't can't even do glycolysis, so they have no way of getting ATP on their own. They have to get all of the energy from inside the cell. They have to use the cell's machinery in order to copy their genomes and make proteins. Um, so they have to be inside of another cell in order to reproduce. Now, that means that they do possess a genome. They do reproduce, and they do evolve, which are all properties of life. But we'll see that their genome and reproduction, to a lesser extent evolution, is fundamentally kind of different from the way that living organisms do these things. All viruses have an intracellular and extracellular state. And uh, we typically refer to the extracellular state as a viroid or virus particle. We'll get into exactly what that means in a second. So, most viruses are very specific for what they infect. Like, human viruses infect humans. Bacteria viruses infect bacteria. You know, the tobacco mosaic virus infects tobacco plants. Uh, some viruses have a broader, what we call, host range. Um, but even then, it's, it's fairly specific. Um, there's not very many viruses that can infect, say humans and birds. There's a couple, but it's not common. However, that, that being said, um, pretty much every type of life that we've looked to see whether or not they have viruses have some viruses that affect them. So like mammals have viruses that affect them. Plants have viruses that affect them. Uh, bacteria have viruses that affect them. I'm not sure that we've really ever looked to see whether or not archaea have viruses, um, but if we looked, I feel pretty confident that we would probably find some. There are probably some extremophiles out there that live in environments that are just naturally hostile to viruses, like maybe hyperthermophiles probably don't have very many viruses that affect them, but in general, for every living thing, there's going to be some virus that infects it. So what are viruses made out of? Well, there are some things that all viruses have, and then there are some things that are optional. Some viruses have, some don't. So all viruses possess nucleic acid genomes and protein. So the nucleic acid genome can be either DNA or RNA, double-stranded or single-stranded, 
circular or linear. So for cells, like our genomes are double-stranded DNA, and then we have single-stranded RNA that conveys genetic information to be made, right? Transcripts. So inside of most cells, you will find both double-stranded DNA and single-stranded RNA. In viruses, you know, some of them are gonna have DNA, some of them are gonna have RNA. Some of them have single-stranded DNA, some of them have double-stranded DNA, some have single-stranded RNA, some have double-stranded RNA, which is very different from uh, normal cellular structure. Like, in normal cells, you find double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, typically. Uh, in viruses, they're much more willing to mix and match. So, the... The nucleic acid genome usually packed inside, and then all viruses also have proteins. Specifically, the type of protein that all viruses have is a structural protein. Yes, I know, Kat, you're very famous because you're on all of my videos, but please be quiet now. Um, the protein is a structural protein called a capsid. Now there are, like every virus has different capsid proteins, but what a capsid means is, um, so protein, or uh, uh, viruses have this protein shell, right? And the shell is called a capsid, and the capsid is made out of individual uh, capsomeres, so like, that's a capsomere, that's a capsomere, that's a capsomere, that's a capsomere. All of those individual proteins, capsomeres, come together to form this capsid protein coat or protein shell. Um, and this is something that all true viruses have. And it's structural. These proteins are not enzymes typically um capsomeres are like what forms the outside of the virus because viruses are not necessarily membrane bound structures cool so those are the two things all viruses are going to have what's the optional stuff some viruses have a lipid envelope. Here you can see uh, this is a, um, a virus here. The genome is actually going to be contained inside this. And you see this spiral-shaped protein capsid on it. But then outside of that, there is a lipid membrane. Uh, this is called an envelope. Viruses that have a lipid membrane are called enveloped viruses. Viruses that do not are called naked viruses. This lipid envelope is usually very similar to a cell membrane. In fact, most of them are derived from cell membranes. Uh, bacteria will pick up some lipid from the cell membrane on its way out of the cell, and that's what its envelope is. So uh, some viruses, again, not all, will have spikes. Um, these are usually like protein or glycoproteins that stick out from the virus. Some of them are going to stick out from the envelope. Some of them might stick out from the capsid. But in either case, uh, these spikes are often used in uh, attachment and uh, are part of how the virus can get into cells. Proteins, specifically enzymatic proteins. We said that all viruses have capsid structural proteins. Some viruses will also carry enzymes with them. And these enzymes are usually going to be enzymes that do something that 
the, uh, the cell that they're infecting does not normally do. For example, the, uh, the virus HIV, everyone's probably heard of it, when it infects a cell, it carries in a, uh, an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And what reverse transcriptase does is it turns RNA into DNA. Now, you've got lots of proteins naturally in your cells that turn DNA into RNA. That's transcription. That's something that you do. You don't usually turn RNA into DNA. But in order to complete its life cycle, HIV starts off with a single-stranded RNA genome, and it has to be copied into a double-stranded form before it can integrate itself into your cells. So it has to take this special enzyme, reverse transcriptase, with it into the cell to do this copying because it's not something that your cell naturally does on its own. There are other viruses that have specific needs um, that they have to take their own virus or their own enzyme in with them. So some viruses will carry a limited set of enzymes in with them. So what are the general differences between bacteria and cells? We said the bacteria are not cells. Um, they aren't. What are the things that make them different? Mm, there's a few. So first off, they're not cells. They don't have a lipid membrane. Um, so viruses are only metabolically active inside the cell, right? Outside of a cell, they actually can't really be considered to be alive. They don't do much in the way of chemistry outside of the cell. But when they get inside of a cell, they kind of like blossom and germinate. Um, viruses do not divide or grow. Viruses don't get bigger. They don't make new viruses by splitting in two through mitosis or binary fission or anything like that. That's the way cells go. And obviously, viruses are not cells. Cells are cells. Blah, blah. Um... Most, like all viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. Most cells are free living, though there are some cells that require living inside of other cells. Viruses can contain either DNA or RNA, um, but generally do not contain both. Cells typically contain both DNA and RNA, but use them differently. Viruses... Their genomes can be double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA. They can be circular or linear. For cells, the genome is double-stranded DNA, typically circular in prokaryotes, linear in eukaryotes. Viruses are typically much smaller than cells. Viruses range in size from 10 nanometers to 400 nanometers. That's pretty much smaller than you can see with a light microscope. And we call that ultramicroscopic because a normal light microscope actually can't see them. They're too small. It requires what's called an electron microscope to be able to see them. Uh, the smallest cellular material, uh, smallest cells are like 200 nanometers which is pretty close to the size of the largest viruses. Um, and cells can get up to 12 centimeters in diameter, which is quite large. What divides the inside of a virus from the outside of a virus is the protein capsid. In a cell, what divides the inside from the outside is the phospholipid membrane. And last, how they replicate. Cells replicate by asexual or sexual means, but generally speaking, they divide. 
viruses are much more like an assembly line. They manufacture parts, and then those parts are put together, in assembled, into a virus. A cell doesn't make, you know, a set of organelles and some membrane, and then assemble it piece by piece together. No, it just grows and divides. But viruses are very different. So, what are the different forms that viruses can adopt? There are actually several terms that apply to viruses in different states of their life. Um, I mentioned that all viruses have a extracellular state and an intracellular state, and these are very different parts of their life cycle. A virion, or virus particle, this is a virus that has its protein coat on and is typically found outside of the cell. So this is those pictures that I was just showing you. Like you might have, you know, a virus, maybe it's got some spikes coming off of it, and that's the, the protein coat. And then inside you'll have some DNA or RNA. Right. And this is floating around outside the cell. We call this a virus particle because it has distinct boundaries. You can tell where the virus begins and ends. If I had, like, this, all right, I could say that is three virus particles. They're distinct, and I can count them. Once a virus gets inside of a cell, the cell is infected with the virus, but you can't really tell like how many viruses are in there. Like you've got a bunch now viral DNA doing its thing. You have a bunch of viral pieces being made. I can't say how many viruses are in that cell. The cell is just now virally infected. It's not distinct particles. So inside the cell, it's usually just called a virus or a viral infection. Because it's not really distinct. It's sort of smoothed out everywhere. A provirus or prophage is what happens when viral DNA gets integrated into the host genome. So say we've got a cell here, all right? And say that this cell has, uh, you know, some DNA in it, and this cell gets infected with a virus, and that virus splices its DNA into a portion of the cell's DNA. So now the virus is a part of the cell's genome. In this case, we would call it a provirus. If it happens in a bacteria virus, bacteria viruses are often called phages. And so in bacteria, we would call this state a prophage. Pro means kind of like before or primitive or inactive in this case, because usually in the proviral or prophagic state, the, the virus is inactive, although not always. Bacteriophages. Phage means like mouth or to eat. These are bacteria eaters. We actually discovered the existence of viruses long before we had the technology to see them. The way we discovered them was, you know, you'd be growing some bacteria and you notice, hey, there's this part of the bacteria, like the, the field of bacteria that I'm growing where it like the bacteria seems to have melted and died. So we knew that there was this thing that was killing the bacteria. We knew that it was too small to see, but we knew that it could spread from bacteria to bacteria and that it 
seemed to be self-replicating. So we called these bacteriophages, bacteria eaters, long before we could ever actually see them. Um, bacteriophages are very specific and pretty kind of different from eukaryotic viruses. Um, and there are generally three varieties, what we call virulent, temperate, and filamentous. Virulent is um, aggressive, spreading. A virulent phage, when it infects a bacteria, will replicate, burst out, infect more bacteria, replicate inside of them, burst out, infect more bacteria, blah, 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 blah. It's always devoted to replicating and spreading all the time. So it's a very aggressive lifestyle, and it only has the one. Temperate phages, right? The key word here is temper, which means control in this circumstance, right? So if you lose your temper, you lose control. Uh, the, the temperance movement was a, a movement against alcohol use because it was thought that correctly, that alcohol makes you lose control of yourself. And so if you were temperate, then you, you wouldn't drink alcohol and would theoretically maintain control. So temp, temperate means controlled, and specifically temperate phages have a choice of different lifestyles that they can adopt. One of those lifestyles is called the lytic, and one is called the lysogenic. Virulent phages all do the lytic lifestyle. Temperate phages have this choice. They have control. We're not really going to talk about filamentous phages right now. Bacteriophages typically do not have an envelope. So no envelope. And they typically do not have internal enzymes, although as we, we will see, they sometimes have a few enzymes like sticking on their outside. But they mostly just have capsid genome. Now, a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. So this is a typical bacteriophage. Right? This is an actual picture of a bacteriophage. This is using a transmission electron microscope. You can see that it looks like some sort of weird demonic hell spider thing that you might kill in Diablo 3, um, where you've got like the body or head here, and then you've got the tail coming off of it, and then you sometimes have these little legs coming off of the tail, and a base plate down here. In like movies or stuff, I often see like viruses in, in humans depicted as looking like this. Like if you watch, you know, Osmosis Jones or something like that, you'll see viruses and they come in and they look like this. This is a bacteria virus. This will never be found inside of a human. This is not a type of virus that infects humans. No virus that infects human cells will look anything even remotely like this. So all non-filamentous viruses can do the lytic cycle. And I'm going to describe for you the steps of the lytic cycle. Uh, the lytic cycle is fast. It aggressively manufactures a large number of phages, and it spreads rapidly, sometimes too rapidly. It can actually kill off all of the bacteria in a local environment and then end up being unable to spread past that point. So step one 
of the lytic cycle is called attachment or adsorption. In this, you have your virus. Viruses, by the way, are non-motile, right? They don't have any choice of where they go. They don't have flagella. They don't have cilia. They can't swim to a particular place. They just bounce around randomly, and they can make one decision. They can stick to something or not stick to something. It isn't even really a decision that they can make. It's by their nature, they stick to some things and they don't stick to other things. So let's see here. The virus is moving randomly, bumps into cells until it lands on one with its tail fiber, boom, sticks. So since the first step is to stick to a cell, the first thing that determines what's called host range Right? The host range is the type of cells that a virus can infect. The first thing that determines that is whether or not it can stick. It sticks by binding to specific proteins on the surface of the cell. So if this is a cell or a virus that can only affect uh, gram negatives, right, it might land on uh, proteins that are on the surface of E. coli and it'll stick. Whereas if it hits um, Staphylococcus, it just won't stick. And if it doesn't stick, it can't infect them. So this is the first thing that determines host range, whether or not a virus can infect a particular type of cell. Can it stick to it? Step two, penetration or entry. In this step, there are, and this is, that exception that I told you about, um, there are usually a few enzymes stuck to the bottom of the base plate. They're not inside, but they kind of got accidentally stuck to the bottom. And remember, bacterial cells typically have a peptidoglycan cell wall. That cell wall is too small to allow the virus entry. So this whole virus can't get in. Instead, what it's going to do is this enzyme that's stuck here is called lysozyme. And what lysozyme does is it cuts the cell wall. So uh, the base of the, 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 the virus is going to kind of like drill a hole in the cell wall. And that's going to allow the genome of the, oops, that's going to allow the genome of the, uh, uh, of the virus to enter in. And here we are. The capsid remains on the outside of the cell. The capsid is basically dead at this point. It's just protein. It's kind of like the husk of a beetle left after, or of a cocoon left after the, the pupa emerges, right? It just sort of hangs there. It'll usually stick to it for a while and eventually fall off. Now, the important thing is that the genome has gotten inside. Steps three and four take place kind of simultaneously, or at least they overlap significantly. Step three is synthesis, and step four is replication. Specifically, synthesis of proteins and replication of the genome. So that genome is gonna code for a whole bunch of viral proteins to get made. So here you can see that all of these pieces of the virus 
you know, you got your, your capsum ears, you got the portions of the, um, the tail, you've got the little bits of the legs. Those are all being made, and you make bunches of them. At the same time-ish, you are also going to degrade the bacterial genome. So you can see here that the genome has been cut apart into little pieces. Now that has two purposes, two functions. First off, it uh, the, the virus only wants the cell to be making viral proteins. So by destroying the host genome, it prevents the host from making its own proteins. And so now the, the only proteins it's going to make are viral proteins. Uh, and secondly, we're going to start replicating the genome a lot. And we're going to need a lot of uh, resources to do that. So we degrade the host genome in order to give us the general resources we need to make a whole bunch more viral genomes. So at this point, the cell has been completely taken over. Host genome's been destroyed. We've got lots of viral pieces, lots of viral DNA. Step five is called assembly or maturation. In this step, we, well, assemble the virus. We put all of the various pieces of the virus together and we stuff the genome inside. The last step is called release or lysis. In this stage, uh, a final protein, lysozyme, is expressed. And if you'll recall correctly, I said that lysozyme destroys bacterial cell wall. It cuts peptidoglycan, hence lysozyme, cutting protein. That lysozyme is going to degrade the peptidoglycan cell wall. Uh, at that point, the cell will rupture. A little bit of the lysozyme will get stuck to that bottom base plate of the viruses, and then the viruses are going to spread out and infect new cells. So that's the lytic cycle, all right? It's pretty straightforward. Attachment, you stick, entry, you bore a hole, you shoot the genome in. Um, synthesis and replication, you're going to make viral proteins destroy the bacterial chromosome and then replicate the bacteria or uh, the viral chromosome. Assembly, you stick the viruses together and then release, you burst open the cell, releasing the viruses to go infect more cells. That is how the lytic cycle do. Um, and virulent phages can only do the lytic cycle. The lysogenic cycle is an optional cycle that can be done by temperate phages. Temperate phages don't have to do the lysogenic cycle, but they can under some circumstances. So let's take a look at it. So they start from the same place, right? Step one is still attachment. It's exactly the same as step one for the lytic cycle. In fact, as we'll see, the lysogenic cycle is actually a little outgrowth loop from the lytic. The step two is gonna be penetration, exactly the same as it was before. At this step, temperate phages have their choice they can go on with the lytic cycle into um, you know, uh, replication and synthesis and assembly and then release and go off to infect more stuff. Or they can go into the lysogenic cycle. 
And what determines the choice that they make is often the state of the cell. If the cell is not growing very quickly, the cell's not very healthy, maybe it's damaged in some way, then it's better to just skim all the resources you can, make as many viruses as you can, blow up the cell and try to find a better cell. But what if the cell's a pretty nice place? It's a healthy cell, it's growing fast. You might wanna hang around for a while. And in this case, you can go into step three, which is the first step of the lysogenic cycle, integration. So you see what happened here? That viral genome spliced itself into the bacterial genome. So now we have this segment right here where the viral genome is now inside the bacterial genome. And it becomes a prophage. Once it's inside the bacterial genome, it can stay there for as long as it wants. So the next step is reproduction. The cell just makes more cells because that's what bacterial cells do. They go around making more bacterial cells. But look, every time you make a new bacterial cell, what are you replicating? You're replicating the prophage as well. And the prophage can stay inside the bacteria for as long as it wants. It could stay inside for a few minutes. It could stay inside for years, just letting the cell spread. But eventually, something is going to happen to make it want to leave. Usually this is going to happen when the bacterial cell is either damaged, uh, when it suffers mutations, because like mutations are damaged to the DNA and that's where the prophage is living. So if the cell starts to suffer mutations, prophage wants to get the heck out of there. Um, or sometimes if the cell like metabolically slows down, stops replicating, the goal of the virus, the goal of every virus is to make more copies of the virus. So if the cell, cell stops replicating, the virus has no more reason to be in there. So step five, something happens to make the prophage want to leave. And we get induction or excision. The viral genome splices itself back out and then it gets right back onto the lytic cycle, going through assembly, release, synthesis, uh, all of that, going out and infecting new cells. Now, when the uh, temperate phage is inside the bacterial genome, it's kind of allied with it. Like, it's living inside the bacteria. So at that point, the phage wants the bacteria to succeed as much as possible. Because every time the bacterial cell replicates or spreads to a new place, it carries the phage with it. So there's a process called lysogenic conversion. Right? Viruses can carry with them cool new information that teaches the bacteria how to be a better bacteria. So when a temperate phage integrates its genome with the bacteria, it can carry new genes. These genes can include, like the first thing that it's gonna do is teach the cell how not to get infected by other viruses, right? Because if you're, if you're a nice lysogenic phage, sitting inside of a bacterial chromosome, the last thing you want is some other virus coming in and muscling in on your turf. So it's gonna teach the, the bacteria how to not get infected by viruses. Um, it might bring in new metabolic states, like uh, teach it how to, um, uh, to, to use new energy resources, 
often it brings in virulence factors that teach the uh, the bacteria how to become more pathogenic. Um, now that's great, you know, as far as it goes. But eventually, this virus is going to come back out of the genome and kill the cell. Unless, all right, let's have a little bacterial cell here. And this bacterial cell has its, you know, its genome. And that genome has a prophage inside of it. Well, the ability of the prophage to excise itself, to hop back out of the genome and get back on the lytic cycle, that's controlled by genes, just like everything in the cell is controlled by genes, right? It's specifically controlled by some genes in the viral DNA portion. What happens if this cell suffers a mutation? And specifically, it suffers a mutation in the gene that allows the viral chromosome to leave. Now, that prophage is stuck. It can no longer get out of the host cell. It can no longer get back on the lytic cycle. It becomes a permanent part of the bacterial genome. And with many bacteria, we can actually look at, sequence their genomes, and we can see, ah, this part of the genome looks different from the rest of the genome. It probably came in originally as a virus that got stuck inside. And when that happens, that cell and all of its progeny become permanently lysogenically converted. And whatever benefits they gained become a permanent part of their genetic repertoire. So that's the basics of viruses and bacteriophages. We're going to talk further about human and mammalian disease-causing viruses in class. But I wanted you to see this because it's going to be very important to some of the mechanisms of genetic change in bacteria that I'm going to talk about next.